uh, what I'd like to do is to give you a little bit of uh, the journey that I've had since my, my very early days programming the Fortran for the Quasar trial, um, up to the point where I, I've rather s surprisingly to me actually been allowed back into the building, <laughs> albeit having, having served a sufficient exile. Um, you'll notice that uh, certain names that are quite familiar uh, continue to crop up over the course of the uh, story that I'm going to tell of the last sort of 15-20 uh, years as a statistician. Um, and uh, I have great gratitude to, to everybody from here who has mentored me, um, the different Richards and Rory and Colin and everybody else like Paul and Liz who've uh, helped me at the very beginning of my career and, and are continuing to help and mask my ignorance at this stage. Uh, and I'm sure I've missed many people out as well. Um, I'd also like to uh, pay tribute, obviously, to the support of my family, my wife Mary, uh, and my daughter Rose, who has uh, taken a day out from her GCSE controlled assessment in English uh, to travel up here. I, I think in the hope of there being snow that will keep us stranded here overnight and uh, fail to get to school tomorrow. Um, but I'd also like to pay tribute to, to two other people who aren't here. Um, first of all, Professor Alla Burnett, um, who taught me a, how to talk to a clinician, and, and B, also for somebody who was brought up in the, the soft uh, eastern side of Scotland, how to talk to a Glaswegian, um, and the late Professor David Grimwade, who did so much to introduce me to the underlying concepts of how one thinks about hypothesis-driven science rather than data-driven numbers uh, and look at things in a different way. Um, I think it's traditional to start off with a, with a quotation, or it is in all of my talks, and I think this, this sums it up. I, I never set out to be a medical statistician. Um, I, it's an entirely accidental thing. Um, there probably is some genetics in it. My mother was a statistician, um, so I'm sure that we could, we, could, we could do some sort of whole genome sequencing and, and determine what it is that actually... Uh, made me end up as a statistician, but uh, I certainly never went to university with the idea of being a statistician. Um, and it, it was purely through the, the, the good luck and good fortune of coming to work in CTSU that a spark was, uh, was lit. And um, I think in terms of the odyssey, the, the, the journey I'd like to talk about, um, a lot of the... Uh, things that I have learned have come from things going wrong. Um, I think probably I, what I have learned is not so much what to do and how to do it, but what not to do. Um, Will Rogers, who of course is such a famous person in medical statistics circles that he even has a phenomenon named after him, um, the uh, cracker barrel philosopher from, from the States, um, I think, uh, managed to uh, split people into three personalities very well. Um, where I am in that, I think, probably can be said uh, in terms of the number of uh, electric fences I seem to have accidentally discovered during the course of the last 25 years. So, the great thing, I think, about medical statistics is the idea of trying to understand what is good and what works and what doesn't work. Um, and, of course, we've made huge strides um, over the course of the last particularly, I think, probably 60 to 70 years, um, where we've moved from the sort of patent medicine and, and pharmacopoeia that is largely reliant either on snake oil or laxative properties, um, and in particular things like bile beans and these completely unsubstantiated claims. Um, for instance, cure for cirrhosis of the liver in all female complaints, etc. Uh, and of course the, the um, probably increasingly apocryphal, but, but certainly examples of things which are far worse, which make all sorts of unbelievable claims about 
cleansing and, and improving things. And I think that one of the great things that was done over the course of the last 70 years since the Second World War is to actually cleanse, of course, the drug books of these sorts of things. Um, so what we have to do, of course, is replace these old treatments with things that are better and work better. Clinical trials that have enabled us to find things that actually work um, we may be starting to take steps backwards uh, in the sense that certainly in the more advanced and more difficult hematological cancers, we are beginning to rely far more on what are called single arm phase two trials. In other words, these, uh, these sorts of case series, I think, is probably the better way of looking at it. Uh, in other words, largely anecdotal evidence but is being compared with some sort of historical, never-moving gold standard. Um, and one of the big areas for this uh, is in treating acute myeloid leukemia in the older patient. This is patients with an e median age of about 75, uh, where fundamentally the clinician and patient have agreed that the approach of intensive chemotherapy is more likely to do harm than good. Um, and this, of course, is an area where survival is poor, remission rate, in other words, getting rid of the, the uh, disease is poor, uh, and it's somewhere where <clears throat> the most recent licensed treatment is licensed on the base of a, basis of a single arm study. In fact, two single arm studies that are completely uncontrolled. Um, and in this condition, um, in terms of the remission rates, this is considered to be the gold standard. This was the first Tri randomized trial really in this area, uh, which compared low-dose cytarabin, low-dose ARAC, uh, against basically palliation with hydroxyurea. Uh, and because hydroxyurea doesn't really have any chemotherapeutic properties, there's no remission rate with hydroxyurea, but you get an 18% remission rate uh, with low-dose cytarabin. Um, and this is considered to be the historical standard. This is what is always quoted against with these other therapies. Um, now, this, however, is the uh, story of 20 years nearly, in fact, 18 years of randomized trials in this population. So this is the first trial that was run between 1998 and 2004. This is what's the AML-14 trial. Um, and this extend, extended out here, and then we moved into AML 16 between 2006 and 2012. And then for the last eight years, um, there has been a multi arm, multi stage platform trial um, comparing Ludos RSC against a bucket of other treatments um, called LI1, less intensive one. Uh, and you can see here that we've done this against a variety of different treatment uh, uh, options. Um, and the important thing is the eligibility criteria have never changed. But uh, the re remission rate, the p-value, is indeed significant, and it ranges anywhere from 8%. These are all cohorts of at least 50 patients, which is kind of the size that you're seeing in these non-randomized phase 2 trials. Um, ranges from anywhere from 8% up to about 33%. This is comparing it against nothing. This is comparing against less intense therapy. And this, Vosoroxin, um, turned out to be actually its main problem was that it was too aggressive a therapy. Uh, it may have a role in, in fitter patients. But fundamentally, that means that if you come in with something that says, oh, I've got a remission rate of 25%, well, it's either very good, or it's very bad, or we haven't got a clue. Because we don't have a comparator arm to deal with. And we're dealing with a comparator arm where people are happy to, were happy when you do the historical control 
This is a randomization of low-dose cytarabine versus nothing. In other words, the <coughs> clinician and the patient were happy to receive nothing but palliation. And those may be very different patients from people who are happy to be randomized with low-dose cytarabine and low-dose cytarabine plus vozoroxin. <coughs> so obviously it is, it's, it's unfortunate that I think that in certain areas at least we seem to be now regressing and we seem to be taking far more in the sort of anecdotal evidence from a few people in a phase two trial where really there, there is no idea of what the response means. <coughs> we know that outcomes in fact here are improving over time in this group of patients. One of the things that uh, was learned, for example, was that remissions come late in these patients when you treat them with cytarabine, so you have to persist. If you don't get a remission after two courses of therapy, carry on. Median time to remission is about 90 days here, so that's three courses of therapy. Um, and clinicians traditionally were used to saying, oh, the patient is refractory, they're completely off trial, we must give up after two courses. And this may be one of the reasons that we're seeing an improvement in outcomes over time in this group of patients, even though we are not yet seen a treatment that provides a significant benefit on survival. It could also be down to something like supportive care. This is the younger, fitter patients. Um, and this is the, the traditional figure that one always sees for um, uh, trials in acute myeloid leukemia and you can see how over the last nearly 50 years um, we've managed to improve survival from from very bad sort of less than 10 percent surviving up to the point where you know your 10-year survival is very nearly 50 percent unfortunately again we've not come across a major advancement in care we're still giving the same sort of dornarubicin cytarabin therapy as a backbone of therapy that we were giving in the 70s. We do give double induction, but the increasing um, improvement from, say, in 1985, when the AML-10 trial had double induction using cytarabin dornarubicin etoposide to the 2010 to 2014, when the backbone of chemotherapy was dornarubicin, cytarabin, and etoposide, um, clearly demonstrates that there are other things going on. Um, so this obviously means that we need these randomized trials because the patient mix may be changing. The surrounding circumstances are probably changing. We're probably getting better. And actually, it may be one of the be great benefits of stem cell transplantation is we're better at dealing with side effects. Um, so obviously, randomization, as we know, is the idea of, of, of allocating without foreknowledge. Generally speaking, a 50-50 uh, split. Uh, and of course, the problem with a simple randomization when you toss a coin is that you don't always get 50-50 split. And as the smaller trials here show, um, it's entirely possible, of course, to get a relatively large imbalance. This would be a 40% imbalance between arms. That would be 30% in one arm, and so three in one arm and seven in the other arm here. Entirely plausible with 10 patients. In other words, you have the ability to lose power within these prognostic subgroups. Uh, and you have the idea of imbalances. Um, so you either make the trials much bigger, which is great, um, but you may still affect the smaller subgroups, um, or you try and ensure the balance using stratification and using a balance block list or a minimization algorithm. Um, but the important thing always is that there is no foreknowledge of treatment. Um, and this is important when one comes to trying to deal with the idea of getting balanced treatments and foreknowledge. Uh, and I want to show you a, a, an example that, uh, that was come up with while I, while I was working in Birmingham. Um, I'm going to make this very extreme and very simple. Uh, I'm going to say that every other patient, I want the numbers in each arm to come into balance. So in other words, if patient 1 gets A, patient 2 must get B. If patient 3 gets B, patient 4 must get A. 
So everything must be made up of these blocks of A, B, and B, A in, in terms of my treatment list. So here's an example uh, treatment list, A, B, B, A, A, B, A, A, B, B, A. Um, and now if you guess the first one, and this is not a blinded trial, so you know what the previous allocation was, what you say to yourself is, well, I'll tell you what, I'll now guess the opposite of whatever I had. So the first one, the A, I can't guess. But I know that B must follow because the first one was A. Now I'm going to guess A, I get it wrong. But don't worry, because next time B has to be the opposite of A. So I get that right. Uh, a is right. Uh, and so on. Um, and there they are. Those are the uh, correctness. There's the first one you throw away, and you can see that, that if you do throw away the first one, you have six correct and three wrong. In other words, you've got twice as many correct guesses as you have before. So that means that you're able to guess the next treatment, and that means that if you know what the next treatment is, and you have a group of patients sitting outside in the corridor, you can shuffle your group of patients to get them in in the order that you would like them to be. In other words, if A is much more toxic or intense than B, maybe the people who get A, then you know are going to get A, are the people who are going to be fitter. And the problem with this is that <coughs> that's an extreme example. If I actually balance every other treatment, then I get a 75% guess rate on average. Half the time I am going to be 50-50, and half the time I'm going to be absolutely right. Um, and you can see this, if you guess the opposite of the last allocation, um, you can still get a certain edge over pure chance, even with the block lengths of six patients or eight patients. And by the time you get to 16 or 20 patients, of course, a lot of the, the, small, the size of the block is suddenly getting that you may be in a half block and so the balance may not be as good. But you can do better than that so long as you have a post-it note. If you keep tally of everything that you've actually been allocated and you just say, well, actually, the whole point is I want to get into balance. So if it's gone 5-4 in favour of A, I'm going to guess B, because B is the one that's been less done. Then actually, your edge, even with a block length of 6, which is probably what, you, what would be standard in a clinical trial, it's two-thirds. Two-thirds of the time you can be right. And when you're dealing with a moderate treatment effect, that gives you the ability to introduce a relatively moderate, in fact, maybe even bigger than moderate, bias. In other words, you've now got the ability to introduce a selection bias that could be of the same order of magnitude as the treatment effect. So randomization with the inability to guess, of course, is, is important. But of course, the other thing we need to do is we need to follow up patients and analyze them according to their allocated treatment, the, the intention to treat principle. Um, more importantly, we need to collect data on everybody, irrespective of their compliance or their treatment allocation. Um, and here's, a, here's an example from, a, from a, uh, an arbitrary degenerative condition. So um, here we are, we have a thought experiment. Uh, a chronic degenerative disease where every month a patient will decline by 10 points, purely arbitrary 10 points. So wherever they are at baseline, one month later, they're 10 points worse, 20 points, 30 points. Um, and I'm going to do a randomized trial. Um, you can see that uh, I, I've, uh, I've done a power calculation, and I've decided that the effect size is going to be enormous. Uh, and uh, I'm going to do 20 versus 20, uh, mainly because I can fit it on the screen. Um, the medicine doesn't actually have any, act any, any effect on the condition. It's, it's, it's uh, valueless in this condition, but it does have side effects. And the side effects are sufficiently bad that people will stop taking their medication. 
So you can, you can think of all sorts of rather nasty gastrointestinal side effects, headaches, migraines, whatever you like. Um, but people will stop taking the medication. And it's quite extreme, actually. I, I'm going to say that in the first month, a quarter of the people taking that medication are going to stop it because they can't deal with the side effects. Um, now, of course, as time goes on, those rates will drop, so I'm going to say that 10% in month two and month three also drop out. Uh, and in placebo, well, there are no side effects because there's nothing in the placebo. So I'm going to ignore anything like a nocebo effect. I'm going to ignore these, the, 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 the phantom side effects. I'm going to make this entirely simplistic. And... What's going to happen is when people stop taking their medication, they're not coming back to clinic, busy clinic, full clinic, haven't got the resources to be able to get the research nurse to spend all the time doing the very long assessments on the patients. It may take an hour or so to actually get these assessments done. So the person is not taking the medication, we're going to stop doing it. Um, and the protocol is to says that if somebody misses a visit, we'll just We'll just use their most recent visit. So that means that everybody can contribute to every time point throughout the trial. So what does this mean? Well, if you actually look at what people are measuring, you'll see here that we now have 20 pairs of patients, um, one on each treatment. There's a blue, which is placebo, and uh, a rather ghastly orange color, which is the active treatment. Well, we know 25% of them are not going to get to one month. So they've been greyed out, if you like, faded out at the top. Uh, and they, of course, don't decline now because we're using last observation carried forward. So actually, while the average decline on placebo is 10 points, the average decline on the active treatment, well, it's 10 points in three quarters of the patients and nothing in the other quarter. So the average is seven and a half points. Um, Carry on, 10% drop out again. You get 20 points, obviously, in placebo. It's always going to be 20. Uh, and then the average decline is 14 uh, in the active treatment, uh, 30 and 19.5. Um, so if you actually look at the apparent effect of the drug after each treatment, in other words, the apparent effect of the method of analysis after each treatment, because we know the drug doesn't do anything. So this is the bias introduced by the method of analysis, you can see that not only does it grow, but actually because there are continuing dropouts, it's growing faster than linearly. In other words, when you've got a declining condition, last observation carried forward actually rewards toxicity. If you were, if, if you were looking to cheat, then adding a few side effects to a, to a, tre to a treatment would actually improve the apparent treatment effect. Um, of course, I've assumed everybody is declining equally. I've, 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 there is no heterogeneity of people here at all, uh, which is probably an oversimplification of reality. We know there's heterogeneity. And it, you may argue that your decision to drop out from treatment may be related not only to your toxicity, but to whether you perceive you're getting any benefit. In other words, the people who drop out maybe the people who are declining more quickly. So actually, they're de the, you're taking the worst cases out of one arm and keeping them in there. So actually, the effect could be even bigger. Um, all very simple, all very straightforward. Even an Excel spreadsheet can deal with that. Nobody would really do that, would they? Well. Interestingly enough, this, uh, this was a piece of work that uh, Richard Gray um, asked me to look at over, uh, over the issue of the AD2000 trial. So this is cholinesterase inhibitors for Alzheimer's disease, chronic, declining condition, um, where last observation carried forward was probably the most common method of analysis used and where benefits seemed to be rather good, and where, indeed, there was no retrieved dropout. There was no attempt to get, an, get an, a result from people who've dropped out of treatment. Um, and this forest plot, um, 
you'll notice that the, the, the actual names of the trials have been removed to protect the uh, guilty, I suppose. Um, you'll see here that actually there's no heterogeneity between the trials, there's no heterogeneity between the drug categories. In other words, our answer here is, is that basically uh, there is no evidence to say anything other than just generally speaking. You've got this odds ratio of 1.67, this, this highly significant excess of early dropouts in patients treated with active drug. And this doesn't take into account actually the timing of the dropout. Because actually patients who were on active treatment dropped out early, because, presumably because of side effects. Patients who were on placebo dropped out later in their course of therapy. So not only is there an excess, but these ones will have had less chance to decline before they dropped out compared to these who dropped out later. So this is a, 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 an example of how one needs to get, it's very difficult, but actually that, that modeling and, and imputation methods can actually give you entirely the wrong answer. So, let's assume we've done a trial properly this time. We've got the average effect of a new treatment, um, but of course not every patient is the same. We've touched on that in the Alzheimer's example. People do not all decline at the same rate. Does that mean that the effect of the treatment is different? Does the treatment only work in some people? You give a new treatment and still people will die. Does that mean that it's only working in certain people? And that's a hard question to answer because that's not the question we set out to ask when we did our trial in the first place. What we set out to ask in the trial in the first place is, does this work on average? Is this an, av an overall average benefit that is clinically relevant? And to deal with the idea of whether things work differently for different patients, you're going to need more participants because you're now looking at an interaction rather than an overall effect. Um, and this brings, brings us very neatly to, to uh, my return uh, to um, the Nuffield Department of Population Health and CTSU uh, uh, and my new role working with the Early Breast Cancer Trialist Collaborative Group because one way of actually combining enough data to be able to look at these things is of course to do a meta-analysis. And in particular, to do a meta-analysis where you have the individual patient data. Because that allows you not only to pick up more up-to-date data, uh, it allows you a consistency of the definition, and of course it allows the exploration of the subgroups. Um, and I'd like to show you an example where... Uh, really, I think an IPD meta-analysis is probably giving the right answer. Uh, and the FDA may have got to the right answer, but maybe by a slightly different route. Um, and that's the drug gemtuzumab azogamycin. I said to you in AML, we've not had any major breakthroughs. We've had one, really, that's, that's, that's come forward during the period of those trials that I showed you between 1970 and 2014, if you exclude people with APL. And that is the one real approval was for gemtuzumab azogamycin. Um, and this was based upon a pivotal study with 271 patients in it uh, and an individual patient data meta-analysis with 3,300 patients in it, including that one trial. Um, and the reason I think that the meta-analysis is important is actually the trial that was used as what they call the pivotal trial um, was this one here. So out of five trials that were performed of adding gemtuzumab azogamycin or GO to standard chemotherapy, um, there was a fairly consistent evidence on reducing the risk of relapse. Uh, but the FDA at that stage weren't interested in relapse, that survival is the thing, and particularly in hematological malignancy. Um, so there was one trial that showed the drug sufficiently improved survival. That was in patients aged over 60. Um, the first large randomized trial 
suggested that actually your genetics might be important as to whether the drug works. Uh, so these two have both got 1,100 patients in it. This one with 271 <coughs> patients finds a very large survival benefit in patients with uh, a bad risk genetic mutation. Um, the company's own suggested trial closed early uh, because of a toxicity signal after s with 600 patients uh, and one trial never hit the light of day. So we need to unpick the information and I'm not going to show you all the uh, various forest plots but um, I'll cut to the chase um, and I'll show you the actual individual patient data meta-analysis. In other words, we can get all five trials and not just the published results, um, which demonstrated about a 3% absolute survival difference, which represents a 10% proportional risk reduction. Um, single, this is for basically giving one or two shots of a drug. So it's, it's not like giving a, a long course, it's just giving one or two doses of the drug. Um, so obviously we now have these issues about can we find out who benefits? Well, as is often the case, while absolute benefits may differ, the relative risk reduction doesn't seem to change very much. Um, except when you, you, you see the odd outlier going on. But for here, there is no significant heterogeneity uh, by what sort of background chemotherapy you give, uh, by your sex, and actually nothing by um, age either, uh, unless you, you are the sort of person who believes that very suddenly a drug which works up to the age of 39 and beyond the age of 50 should suddenly become adverse between the ages of 40 and 49. Um, so this is a, a actually quite a nice illustration that these sort of chance fluctuations do happen. So what about the, the two suggested subgroups that might benefit more? Well, there's the lack of heterogeneity here. Um, but let's look at the cytogenetic risk group. There is uh, a significant test for heterogeneity and a significant trend um, with the better risk. Uh, and this is persistent whether or not you view the first trial as hypothesis generating or include it. So it would appear, although again, this is, this is you know, it's, it's, it's not exactly clear evidence that it doesn't work in those groups um, because the confidence interval is sufficiently wide to overlap the absolute level. But it, it, there is some evidence that maybe the better risk patients benefit. In particular, people with favorable risk cytogenetics seem to do remarkably well. Uh, and there are the survival curves. So you get a 6% difference in the favorable and intermediate risk patients um, and virtually overlapping curves. Um, what is quite interesting though also is to look at the genetic one in this pivotal trial. So on the left here we see that this is what was being trumpeted, a 60% proportional reduction in mortality in patients who have got this FLT3 ITD mutant. Um, that is significant. It is not significant in the wild type, therefore it works in the mutants. That would be, the, the, uh, would be one of the arguments there. Um, if you put it together in the meta-analysis, well, actually, the, risk, the, the, the proportional re reduction is 15% and 12%. The, the uh, test for heterogeneity, well, the chi-squared doesn't even get above 0.05. It, it, there is no evidence that this drug is in any way anything other than agnostic to FLT3 mutations. So again, the meta-analysis there has actually done some good in the sense that these FLT3 ITD mutations are present only in about 20% of people. And if actually one had believed the small trial with a very large treatment effect in a subgroup, then it could be that 80% of patients wouldn't be able to receive the treatment. So the meta-analysis helps provide reliable or more reliable evidence and actually helps to answer the hypothesis. I think we, need, we, we must view the left-hand 
graph here is being hypothesis generating. It was never planned for, it was never thought to be looked for. This is just part of the let's look at lots of subgroups and see what comes out. Um, so, with this, I, I, having talked about different risk groups and, and these cytogenetic risk groups, um, the other thing that, that, that obviously is, is important is actually looking at the evolution of risk stratification. Um, and here is something where you can use this to, to maybe change therapy or at least der drive a trial where you could randomize to intensify therapy or go down a particular route or not. Um, in other words, if somebody does well or badly early on, does it tell you what's going to happen in the future? It doesn't tell you why that's happened. Uh, and it doesn't actually tell you what to do. So, but it does mean that risk stratification is not constant. In other words, we do need to think about how a patient's risk group evolves over the course of therapy. Uh, and that's particularly true with hematological malignancies where the only therapy is basically drug therapy or transplant. Um, so, for example, uh, again, this is, uh, this is results from the AML trials. And again, you can see that actually um, using uh, real-time quantitative PCR measurements, um, you can take uh, roughly 15% of the patients uh, and turn them to have a really, really bad prognosis simply by using this sort of measurement. doesn't tell us what to do, doesn't tell us why these people are chemo-resistant, but it does say to you that actually that, that, that we early response may actually help us. And this could be useful in breast cancer with, you know, key 67 change moderated therapy. When you've got neoadjuvant therapy, you do have the opportunity to actually think about stratification at various time points and re-stratifying the patient. Um, but of course, this is still dealing with groups. If we go back there, um, you know, that's fine. We've got a 73% versus 24% survival. But actually, a quarter of those people that we've put into the very bad risk group are going to survive, and they're going to survive even without a stem cell transplant. So that stem cell transplant will be giving morbidity without actually saving a life. Uh, likewise, we could say that, oh, 73% is a remarkably good outcome. We're not going to do anything. Well, again, one quarter of those patients uh, will actually die of their disease. And you can see that they're, they're a third of them will indeed relapse, uh, and relatively quickly. So the issue is, can we be more accurate? And of course, this brings us to the, the challenge of in, what, what individualized medicine and the gene signatures. In other words, uh, identifying the sub, you know, we can identify subgroups of patients, but actually, can we get better than 73% versus 24%? Can we actually get to 100% versus 0% so that we know who is going to do badly and we know where we, can, we need to put our resources? Can we identify these patients reliably? Can we identify what's going on in an individual patient case? And of course, this is the holy grail. Um, the problem is, is that as you can see with this data from AML17 again, uh, there are an awful lot of mutations out there. So you've got an awful lot of bits of data. And when you've got lots of bits of data, you've got lots of bits of data that may be misleading. Um, and I'm grateful to the suggestion of Richard Gray to actually look into this um, just after I came here in Oxford. Um, and he suggested looking at the idea, the challenge of this sort of individualized medicine. And so just as with the uh, last observation carried forward example, um, I thought I'd cheat. I thought I would become um, a very bad scientist. Um, so one of the great things is that with all this gene microarray data, there is a requirement to put the data on the web. And one of the uh, 
mixed blessings, therefore, of that is that any, any fool like me can get hold of a pile of microarray data. So I got hold of some microarray data for some leukemia patients treated with imatinib, um, based on this, this paper by McWheeney. Um, 59 patients are treated with imatinib, and the reason I got hold of this data is actually they gave us the response to imatinib as well. So we knew who was sensitive to imatinib and who was not. There's no control arm. There's no idea whether the, these people are just going to do things differently. Um, and they gave us results on 54,000 different probes within the microarray analysis. So I just wanted to look and see how well I could predict outcome on these small patients if I were a complete charlatan. Um, so I decided I'll get some probes. Some of these probes will be dealing with genes that are important to CML. I don't know what they are, but there will be some. But the vast majority will not have anything to do with the disease. So, at random, I'll choose 10, 20, or 30 probes out of the data, um, and then use that uh, to pr produce a discriminant equation. In other words, you find the probability that a patient is going to respond based on the modeling, and then compare your outcome with the data that you actually got. So, basically, because the chances that out of these 54,000 probes, I'm actually going to choose enough of the genes that actually matter in the disease are, is infinitesimal, um, the prediction levels here are down to chance alone. And I've looked at the agreement level. How often do I get it right? Well, with any 10 probes in this data set, on average, I'm 70% accurate. With any 20, I'm 80% accurate. With any 30, I'm 90% accurate. In other words, it's incredibly easy to be seduced by the data and it's incredibly easy to forget what we learned in school that is if you've got two simultaneous equations with two unknowns you can always more or less get a solution if you've got 59 different let's set variables I should be pretty well able particularly given that there will be random noise in the expression levels, I should be pretty well able to fit perfectly those 59 patients. In other words, this sort of thing uh, is remarkably hard to interpret. Um, I can tell you that uh, based on some genomics from an AML trial recently, uh, I now have a signature which is 99.52% specific for having an even trial number. Um, in other words, the more probes you include, the better you fit the data. You're fitting the data, you're not fitting the disease. And that's the big difficulty, is we haven't got enough patients in there to be able to deal with things. We, this is letting the data drive the science. If I went off with my... 30 probes and said, I'm 90% accurate. Here's my gene signature. It's 90% accurate. And you go off and tell a poor lab scientist to go off and do five years' worth of experiments. Well, that's five years' worth of experiments, umpteen mice, and uh, an awful lot of money down the drain. Um, however, it is quite, uh, quite, uh, quite an attractive thing, and maybe this is, this is why... Uh, that uh, the more bio biomedical doctorates we're awarding, the, the, the more deaths we're getting from cancer on Thursdays. Another, in other words, we get another, another sort of false correlation going on. This is the data telling us something. It's not, it's not causative, it's just an association. And this is nothing but an association. So... Coming to, the, uh, coming to the sort of dead stop, I suppose, what are my thoughts on the 25 years or 23 years I've spent away from the, the CTSU environment? Well, I think that 
for somebody who's come from a very mathematical background where, where there are equations and there are absolute truths and there is logic and um, about the only thing that is open to debate is whether you accept the axiom of choice or not and to be honest with you it doesn't really matter. Um, the concept that you can get a plausible but entirely wrong answer I think is something that um, is probably the first thing that, that ignited any sort of enthusiasm for this area. Um, I also think that, it, that one of the important jobs of the statistician uh, is to try and subvert things, it's to try and break it. We're, we're, we're here as your, your, you know, your, your, your handy neighborhood guy with a wrench trying to just sort of destroy the finely, finely built art, um, edifice. Um, we are we are sort of a, a cold bucket of water over over hope and optimism. I think, um, and I think that that's probably a good thing. Um, there's certainly no substitute for getting the data. I actually think that maybe statisticians we're quite prone sometimes to love our equations and love our uh, love love our fancy models. Um, and we don't spend enough time working out whether we can do s the same sort of stuff more simply with more data because the fancier your model the more the assumptions that are going in and the more the assumptions you put in the less opportunity you have to actually really interrogate those assumptions because you've only got one go at the experiment so you can't actually really have a go. Um, and the other thing is to distinguish between what's hypothesis driven and what is hypothesis generating. Were you out looking for it in the first place? That FLIT3 ITD example, hypothesis generating. Um, because you can always find a correlation somewhere if you look hard enough. Um, and I think the whole thing here is also moving forward that we want to improve things. Um, evolution is a as succession of moderate jumps um, and I think that the moderate jumps are important. We have um, another moderate improvement being published in the uh, Lancet next week from the EBC TCG about intensifying chemotherapy. That's another moderate improvement that will save lives we hope. Um, I, have no, I, I, I can't take any credit for it, but, uh, but I do think that that is the sort of thing that is important, making these incremental benefits and also being able to use the power of the 600,000 women in the trials in the early breast cancer trialist collaborative group studies to be able to interrogate precisely who is going to benefit from what treatment and whether these things where we actually see that the relative risk is, is largely common, you know, we, we, we're not seeing big differences in targeted effects, so we need to be able to now identify whether or not these gene, gene signatures actually do tell us what is going on, and we're going to need the large numbers to be able to do that, and that's why I am so excited to be able to come back here uh, and lend my small effort to what I think has been an amazing program of work over the last over 30 years and has the potential to be equally transformative going forward. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And it's just something to remember today. Uh, oh. Oh, um, thank you very uh, much. A present from the department, and uh, we're really very pleased to, to have you back. And I must say, what I really liked was the way in which Robert played with made up data to, to demonstrate how one should not play with real data. And I wonder whether there is a kind of a book there on uh, if people are, are, are so seduced by the idea that treatment effects are different in different categories, um, and however much you exhort them not to believe in them, 
they still believe in them. There's some kind of, there must be some sort of evolutionary advantage or something in believing in subgroups because it's so pervasive. <laughs> but I really like the way in which by, by taking made-up data, one can persuade people to be much more careful with real data. So thank you very much. Well, thank you. Very, very, very oh, uh, thank you. Thank you.